Okay. So remember, we have all these things pushing America to the West, and the only problem is, is that there are other nations in the way of us achieving what we believe is our manifest destiny. Now, when I say that, most of you might automatically think of Spain, but actually the first trouble breaks out between us and Britain up in Maine. Because even at this time, we hadn't really had the boundaries firmly set. Uh, Log New Brunswick is the Canadian province right uh, next to Maine. And um, a logging company <coughs> built a railroad line that cut right across US territory, or what we claimed was our territory. The state militias of both uh, Maine as well as New Brunswick are called up. And uh, the, the US Army is sent out there to keep the peace in 1838 with General Winfield Scott. And uh, basically a truce was signed that prevented open war. So that's on the East Coast side. Meanwhile, if we go out all the way to the West Coast side, we have Oregon. Now remember, at the end of the War of 1812, Britain, Spain, Russia, and America all laid claim to Oregon. But by the 1820s, only the US and Britain uh, continued to hold on to their claims. And in 1827, they extended this agreement indefinitely. The only proviso was that uh, if either country uh, said they wanted to take it over, they had to give the other country a year's heads up so they could discuss it. And things went along am amicably. Remember, the first missionaries out there were, I mean, the first uh, people out there were missionaries to the Native Americans, but more and more settlers went out there as things got settled down. And in 1841, Uwe Young, uh, the, the westernmost settler in the United States, who had built up quite a lot of wealth, did something incredible for his country. He died without a will. Guys, if you die without a will, then basically it's up to the government to decide who gets your money and where your money goes. And because who owns it, Britain or the US? Well, they decide that the probate laws of New York should be followed. And that's because Ewig Young was originally from New York. And by saying we're going to have American jurisdiction over there, that kind of sets up a precedence that the territories might go to America. Well, as more and more people move out there, guys, you have to have a government to kind of bring order and stability. So uh, 52 Canadians and 50 Americans met in the Willamette Valley and they said, okay guys, we got to decide. Are, cause these are the people of Oregon doing it themselves. They said, are we going to go with America or are we going to go with England? And a vote was called for and it was 52 to 50 that the territory was going to go with America. And so they decide that they're going to go to America. A nine-person kind of government was set up that, of course, had a missionary on it. It had a, um, a settler. Uh, it had some scoundrels, okay, kind of like the whole American thing. But they passed the first organic act in which they claim that they would... Um, only remain a republic until such a time as the United States of America extended their jurisdiction over them. Oh, guys, it's supposedly 
going to get real cold on Saturday, but exciting news, I know. Then we get to Texas. All right, guys, remember, Mexico had a lot of what is currently American territory in the Southwest. And after Mexico had the rebellion against Spain, basically they had to deal with a lot of frontier revolts. Basically, the District Federal in the center of Mexico had to go around and basically exert its authority over all the surrounding states and subdue them. The reason it took them so long to get to Texas is because Texas was so far away. Indeed, when Stephen F. Austin moved, got the deal to uh, bring settlers to Texas, this is when Texans called themselves Texicans, uh, he got the deal that they weren't going to have to pay taxes for seven years. Well, he got that in 1824, so by 1832, they're going to start collecting taxes in Texas. That's what Anahuac, which is this little teeny port, like right here's modern day Houston is over here. It's this little teeny port right next to Galveston Bay that basically Mexico was going to start uh, collecting tariffs there, and they had soldiers there. Well, they get into this whole big clavopole that's led by William Barrett Travis, where they laid siege to that fort. They went back to get more guns and supplies from San Felipe de Austin, and to take it back up. Basically, they win that battle at the same time that a guy by the name of uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana uh, wins the presidency in Mexico, and he's like, yeah, we're going to go all federalist. So basically the Texicans say, oh, we did it for Santana. He's our hero. This is for the state of Texas. Yeah. And we got away with it. Well, then, just like three years later, they're re the fort. Travis tries to do the same thing again. He's actually successful in kicking out the Mexican soldados, but instead of being a hero, everybody running like, what the heck did you just do? Now Santana's going to come here and beat the crap out of us. You write a letter of apology. And he said, okay, I'll write a letter of apology. But he was never able to send off that letter because at the same time, Sant uh, Stephen F. Austin had been arrested and imprisoned in Mexico City. He had just been released and getting ready to arrive back in Texas to say, guys, we've got to fight for our freedom. So uh, they lay a siege. We have Gonzalez break out. After Gonzalez happens, the troops march on to San Antonio they, in the siege of Ejara. They take over San Antonio. And the general there, the uh, Mexican general, Martin Perfecto de Cos, promises the Texians that he will not fight against Texas anymore. And we all celebrate, and he leaves. But there's one kind of important fact. Martin Perfecto de Cos, his brother-in-law, was Santa Ana. And Santa Ana was not going to let this rebellion fly. And basically, he built up an army almost overnight. And he marched north. Indeed, uh, Travis had um, gone to the Alamo and... Guys, we didn't, we, Travis went to the Alamo, uh, basically Sam Houston had told him to blow it up because it couldn't be defended, but he decides to hold on to it anyway. Uh, they, the Mexican army catches the garrison, the 183 that we know of that were slaughtered at the Alamo. Uh, they're surrounded, they have about seven days of siege to it. Has anybody here been down to San Antonio and seen the Alamo? Have you seen the big cinegraph where it has all the 183 guys listed on it? All the names are on there. Now see, this is something you, next, guys, if you go to San Antonio and you see this, sit there and everyone will go, wow, look at all those names and you can tell them. Yeah, I, out of all those names, only one of them got a proper Christian burial. All the rest of their bodies were basically thrown into a pile and set on fire. 
Uh, the one guy who got a proper Christian burial was Gregorio Esparza. And the reason why he got a proper Christian burial is because his wife, her sister, was married to a lieutenant in the Mexican army. So the wife goes crying to her sister. Uh, the sister goes crying to her husband, saying, hey, let me spare his body, give him a proper Christian burial. So it happened, he did, and that's why he's the only one out of all of them that got that. Mean, so that's the Alamo. Then we have Goliad. Have any of y'all ever been out to Goliad? Goliad, by the way, is the best reconstruction of the Spanish Presidio in the what is the United States of America. Uh, basically, we took it over. We called it Fort Defiance. Uh, when the Alamo was happening, they kept telling uh, Fannin and his troops at uh, Goliad, hey, come help us out. And he, he waited, waited, waited. Finally, he did leave, but the wagon broke. So he turned around and he went back to Goliad. Well, the very next, uh, as, as he was on his way back, the Mexican cavalry surrounded him. Uh, he gets his thumb blown off. He was in an absolutely terrible position for defense. And he and his men surrender. They all get marched back to Goliad. And on Palm Sunday, they start getting marched out in three different lines. All the sol soldiers think, oh, well, they're just releasing us to go back to the United States. Well, no, because they stopped all three groups, and basically they shot them. So about 400 guys were killed at uh, Goliad. Well, so then uh, Sam Houston takes his army, and he runs up. He keeps going back, back, back getting Santa Ana further and further away from his point of resupply. At San Jacinto, uh, Santa Ana rests his troops, um, and that's when Sam Houston launches his attack on April 21st, 1836. Now, the battle itself lasted only 18 minutes, uh, but the Mexican soldiers were in total and complete disarray. Um, and when the uh, fog of war is finally ends, uh, early the next morning, 630 Mexican soldiers were killed and only nine Texans. So if you look at the casualties of the whole war, they were about equal between Mexico and Texas. <laughs> Well, if y'all remember, Texas, that yellow area, that area that's colored in yellow, is what Texas had been under Spain, what the province of Texas had been under Mexico. But all of a sudden, when we get our freedom, all of this land, all the way up to Wyoming, America claims. I mean, Texas claims. How do we do that? Well, when uh, Santa Ana surrendered, he said that we would have all the land till his troops cross the river to re-garrison their troops. Now, he was talking about the Nueces, because that had always been the boundary of Texas. But there were no garrisons until on the other side of the Rio Grande River. So, because that was the river that he crossed, Texas laid claim to all the lands out to the Rio Grande. And Texas goes to America and says, take us. And America says, no. Now, why would America have said no to Texas? Or the Texians, because now that we're an independent republic, we call ourselves the Texans. And we're actually recognized as a country by uh, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium. And Texas said no, because it didn't want another slave state. Well, then we get President Tyler. Now, I know a lot of you guys are saying, President Tyler, well, the last president that we had elected was William Henry Harrison. Yeah, William Henry Harrison was an old guy. And on the 1.4 mile distance from Nogro Hall to the White House, he kind of wanted to show what a big guy he was. So he went out without his top coat on and walked the whole distance 
Well, he got pneumonia, and 30 days later he died. But John Tyler uh, picks up the torch of expansion, and he supported Manifest Destiny. He got the Webster-Ashburton Treaty that settled the border between Maine and Canada, where the United States remain, retained more than half of the disputed area, so we get even more land than we should have. And he claimed that the uh, re-annexation of Oregon and the re-annexation of Texas were great national matters. He appointed a territorial Indian agent to Oregon, kind of showing, hey, it's going to be American. He, his administration negotiated a treaty to annex Texas, which the Senate declined to ratify because of the slavery issue. Oops. <laughs> and basically our expansion was a major issue in the presidential campaign of 1844. The Whigs candidate was Henry Clay, who opposed the immediate annexation of Texas over reasons of the uncontrolled expansion of slavery. Well, what were the Democrats going to do? Uh, the Democrats had either Van Buren or Polk to choose from. Polk was also against the annexation of Texas because of the uncontrolled expansion of slavery. Polk, however, thought that the annexation of Texas should go ahead. So it, think about it. If uh, Van Buren had won the nomination instead of Polk, that would have meant that you had two guys that were against the uncontrolled expansion of slavery. Might that have changed how the Civil War turned out? I don't know. When it happened, why it happened, I don't know. And it doesn't, you can't re-question history like that because Polk won anyway. And the Democrats called for an immediate annexation of Texas and the expansion of uh, all of Oregon all the way up to 5440. Now, Congress kind of sneaked Polk out of the victory of annexing Texas because shortly before he retired, President Tyler, uh, Texas was admitted to the U.S. by a joint resolution. And guys, we're like the only state that got in by a joint resolution. And also, there are a lot of things that are unique to Texas. Like, Texas owns all of its own land, not the U.S. Uh, the Texas state flag is the only flag that doesn't have to kowtow or be held at a 45-degree angle to the flag of the United States. The flag of Texas, because we were once a nation, can be flown as the same height, not only of the U.S. flag, but as well as all other nations. Any time Texas wants to, we can take a vote and divide into five states, but guys, we cannot see from the Union. We cannot see from the Union. Don't believe anybody who says, yeah, we ought to just get out and be... Well, that would lead to a huge war. <laughs> uh, so uh, Texas gets in, and then Britain doesn't want to give uh, up all that territory up to the 54th degree. I mean, 54th parallel, 40 degrees. 
So basically, they send their Hudson's Bay company to go and basically wipe all of the fur-bearing animals in that area, hunt them out, try to catch as many as they can to really weaken that area there, kind of eco-terrorism. Meanwhile, all the other areas that they used to hunt in, their numbers replenish, and when Hudson's Bay Company goes back there, they start to use scientific uh, ranching that actually make the, their fur numbers greater in that area. And even though we rattled the saber and all that stuff, pretty much both sides agree, agreed on the 49th parallel. Ready for the next slide? Expansion and sectional crisis. The Texas crisis and sectional conflict. Well, guys, Texas boundary proved uh, the focal point for controversy. Because guys, Mexico said it was the Nueces River, that's up where Corpus Christi is. Uh, the US said no, it's the Rio Grande. So basically, uh, Polk has troops landed at Corpus Christi and has them march down the disputed area, uh, down to the Rio Grande River. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mexico, they moved their armies up in that area to reinforce it. And at the Resaca de Palma, both those armies meet, totally catching each other by surprise. Now, there were 1,760 American troops uh, against about 4,800 Mexican troops. But we had better light artillery so when the smoke clears, 33, Amer oh, yeah, 33 Americans are dead. 154 Mexican soldados are dead. And 87 US soldiers are wounded. Whereas Mexico had 205 soldiers wounded. Well guys, this is all the politicians needed. Now they could go back saying that American blood has been shed on American soil. We gotta do something. Now, not everybody in the US was totally gung-ho about the war. You had Thoreau, who wrote his civil disobedience. Basically, he said, you know, just like some people, when we were fighting in the Middle East, they said, oh, this whole thing's just about oil. Well, a lot of people, uh, when we were fighting against Mexico, said, oh, this whole thing is just about slavery. And of course, Texas's annexation focused intense attention on slavery. Southerners saw greater economic and congressional power in the expansion of slavery. Northerners, meanwhile, saw this whole thing that we're us getting, Texas, as proof of the slave power conspiracy and appropriations or how we're going to get money for the war effort uh, were held up by debate over the proposed Wilmot proviso which was a provision that stated that uh, war money would only be given to the war if slavery would not exist and territories taken during the war. Now, even though it may have sounded like a good idea, it was seen as unconstitutional and turned down. Even people in the North voted against it and saw it as unconstitutional. <coughs>
until we go to war with Mexico, almost as soon as the war begins. A lot of the Americans that are living out in California, they established the Bear Flag Republic, revolting against Mexico. Polk sent an army to Santa Fe, which uh, secured the entire region, with, totally without opposition. And in Mexico, the Mexicans were defeated on several fronts. And down here in Texas, where the U.S. Army was, they also had with them what used to be a national unit of a former nation. Now it's a state unit that was totally separate from the U.S. Army. Who were these guys? They were the Texas Rangers with Taylor. All right? Remember, they'd been kind of trying to keep the peace. While we were a republic, Mexico had invaded us three times. And um, these were the guys that basically were the military as well as the law. Um, they got to wear, they didn't have uniforms, they got to wear their own civilian clothes, they got to arm themselves. So these are the first guys that used like a Colt six shooter. And um, they uh, worked with the army. And indeed, these were the guys that at the Battle of Buena Vista saw the Mexican army approaching. Uh, there was a group of about 17 of them. They sent two guys back. The other 15 stayed and fought the Mexican troops in the valley to harass them from coming forward. Now, they were all killed, um, but they were able to hold up the Mexican army just a little bit to give Taylor time to secure his forces. And when Santana came up, they fought. By nightfall, it was a tie. The only reason why we call it an American victory is because the next morning, Santa Ana and his troops evacuated. Why? Because uh, the American troops that had attacked from Acapulco were on their way to Mexico City. So here, General Winfield Scott. He landed at Veracruz. Well, actually, he shelled Veracruz for like about 100 days, which made him not that popular. No, not 100 days. Maybe 30. So anyway, it did cause a lot of uh, civilian deaths and casualties. Uh, when his troops do land, they march in and they accept the surrender of Mexico City. We get the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo signed. And with this treaty, uh, basically the Texas's southernmost border is ruled as the Rio Grande. It is ruled we are not going, to, even though we took about half of Mexico's territory, it was ruled that we would not take any land below the Rio Grande. Because once again, a lot of people said that land would only be good for slavery. We got all of New Mexico, as well as California. And in return, we also turned around and we paid $15 million to Mexico. <laughs> Now that might seem kind of weird that we gave $15 million to Mexico, but also before the war even started, we sent a guy down to Mexico, Poinsett, who brought back news of a flower. Can anybody guess what flower Poinsett brought back? Poinsettias, yeah. Uh, basically though, we said, hey, Mexico, just give us Texas and we'll give you $15 million. Mexico said no, we have the whole war, so 
So now we give them the fifteen dollars of fifteen million that they would have gotten. Uh, all land claims that the uh, Mexican citizens had were supposed to be recognized and still um, held found valid. Uh, they would become full American citizens. Indeed, that's why the Bali family uh, down in South Texas got in, is worth tons of money right now. Because basically they own South Padre Island. Um, and needless to say, that, you all ready for me to break your hearts? Darn, that's the end. <coughs> So guys, some of that stuff is going to be on your final. Uh, have y'all taken a look at your, um, your final review yet? You ought to check it out. It should be under exam reviews on your canvas. Just take a look at some of the terms. Seriously, guys. I want you to get a 14 or better on uh, your quiz, uh, your final. Mm -mm -mm.